Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I know Friday morning after the party is a tough slot, but we appreciate those who came. Uh, my name is Jeremy Fischel. I'm the co-founder and CTO over at Syntouch. And I'm going to be talking about work we've been doing uh, in collaboration with Haptex and Shadow Robot Company uh, to create this tactile telerobot that can actually feel uh, as well as have dexterous and fine control. So we're just going to start off right with the demo. So over to my left here is Mike, uh, who's the director of R&D over at Haptex. <laughs> he's controlling this telerobot. Uh, as you can see, he's got this fine precision in his fingertip and able to do these really delicate tasks. Um, with this sense of touch, he's able to feel precisely how much force he's gripping. Uh, if he grabs hard, he could grab multiple cups. And if he sort of softens up his grip, he could kind of let him go one at a time. And he could kind of feel that precisely. And that's the importance that this sense of touch provides. So we'll let him do this, because it's exciting. <laughs> nice work. Thank you. All right, so did you want to do something else? Do you want to continue through? Go ahead and continue. OK, cool. Let's switch back to the slides really quick. So one of the key things I want to talk about today is uh, the role that touch and vision play in dexterity. Uh, vision's been very popular in robotics. Uh, it's common in machine learning and AI-driven events. Uh, and I hope at the end of this talk I can convince you that sense of touch is also incredibly important when it comes to dexterously manipulating and interacting with objects like Mike is doing. So, Touch is uh, one of the first senses to kind of develop in infants. Uh, it's sort of what connects you with the world. It lets you sense what's you, what's your environment. Uh, it's one of the most primitive senses to evolve uh, through time. Uh, it's critical for physically interacting with the world. Today's robots have largely been lacking the sense of touch. Uh, and because of that, they can't do a lot of important things that we could do with the sense of touch. Um, first off, and obviously, they can't qualify what objects feel like based on their sense of touch. We can't sense their texture, uh, if they're warm or cool, uh, different things that might be occluded by vision. We can't sense that. They also lack dexterity. So this is a picture I took a few years ago at uh, RSS when a PR2 robot was being controlled, uh, teleoperated by an operator who's trying to pick up this can of soup, and he actually managed to crush the can, which is something I can't even do. So uh, it's hard to control this fine manipulation without touch. Uh, and because we don't have touch, we need this sense of vision, which is necessary to compensate for not having any sensory input. Uh, on the bottom left, uh, you could see Jesse Sullivan over to the right. Uh, he's a bilateral amputee picking up a plastic cup, just like Mike's doing, but he's got this intense visual focus so he knows when to stop without crushing it. Uh, also, vision's very common in a lot of robotics and uh, interacting with unknown environments. So, uh, one video I'd like to show, and I hope people have seen this, uh, this is from OpenAI. Uh, they're doing some amazing stuff using vision-guided dexterity. Here's uh, actually the shadow hand, which is the same one we're using on this telerobot from our collaborators, uh, manipulating this cube, all driven by vision. So we've got a camera on the top right. Uh, there's some goals being presented to it. Uh, and it is learned through training how to manipulate that hand in a very dexterous way to get to these poses. So amazing work, no touch required. Contrasting that with humans with a sense of touch, this is uh, Felix Zemdegs, who uh, holds the record, or I think he's a former record holder for solving the Rubik's Cube. So amazing dexterity made possible with a sense of touch. But uh, we know that robots, when you're working in a fully defined environment, can actually be incredibly impressive. So don't blink anybody. So that's when the Rubik's Cube is in a fully known, fully defined environment, uh, it can be solved instantly. And that works out great if you happen to know where everything is before you start doing the task. There's a famous Mike Tyson quote, uh, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So what touch actually does is it helps us adapt to when the in fully defined environment isn't as we expected. If something isn't defined properly, what are we going to do about it? And that sense of touch is really critical 
for adapting to those unexpected events. Here's an excellent video uh, from one of our collaborators, Roland Johansson, uh, showing the importance of touch when performing different tasks. So here's a task uh, where the goal is to just pick up a match and light it. Normal performance, normal hand, normal matches, perfectly normal. Easy task, we all know how to do this. Uh, if anyone doesn't like needles, don't look. Uh, and I could explain what's happening. What they're doing here is they're applying a nerve block uh, to the nerve that's leading to the skin uh, in the thumb and forefinger. Uh, and what that does is that makes it so they can't feel their skin. They still have proprioceptive information back in the muscles in their forearm and palmar region, so they could actually feel how much force they're exerting. They just can't feel that fine detail about where the match is in the skin. So let's see how she performs now. So as you see, something that was once trivial now becomes incredibly difficult because we don't have the sense of touch. Uh, and I could assure you if they tried to program a robot to perform this task without the sense of touch, it would be very similar. So what's really interesting about this is, is she does figure it out. And it, it's such an unnatural pose at the end. But using her visual feedback, she's able to figure out how to hold this match in a stable way and light it. The task is possible without touch. And that's one of the key points I'd like to highlight in the talk, is that touch doesn't make impossible tasks possible. It just makes difficult tasks very intuitive and easy uh, and fluid. And that's, that's key here. So just to kind of uh, give an overview of that, when you've got this fully defined environment, robots that have this precision and speed uh, and, and excellent planning and strategy are going to outperform humans every time. But when things are unknown, uh, vision's great for making a plan, but touch is what you need for dexterity to actually adjust, adjust that plan when something unexpected happens. And that sort of fits our definition of dexterity. It's this ability to respond intelligently to unexpected events and fluidly without having to stop and replan. So I'd like to highlight another study one of my PhD advisors had done uh, Look, comparing the performance and role of touch and vision in another type of dexterous task. So this is an unstable spring, uh, and the goal is to press it down with as much force without it buckling. So if you push down too far, it'll buckle. If you deviate to the left or right, it'll buckle. Uh, and you want to get as much force as possible to perform this task well. So they start off anesthetizing the skin. Again, you can still feel the force in your muscles, uh, and blindfolding subjects to get a baseline performance. We then reintroduce the sense of vision, and we do see a significant increase in performance, because without any sensory feedback, adding vision is tremendously valuable. We then look at touch, but with no vision, and we see yet more improvements over vision alone. But what was really exciting about this task is when they had touch and vision combined, there was actually no statistical, statistical difference between touch and alone. So really what I'm getting from this study is if you have nothing, vision's in great, but for a lot of dexterous manipulation tasks, the sense of touch is critical in what your body craves to do that job uh, effectively. So we're advocating, we need these telerobots that can feel. Uh, robots historically done for the dirty, dangerous, dull, and inaccessible tasks. Robots are great for this. We don't want to put people in those situations. But what happens is when you get these dirty, dangerous, uh, inaccessible tasks that require human intelligence, dexterity, uh, and a human touch, you've got to send in a human. Uh, this is a nuclear decommissioning team uh, dismantling a reactor, and they've got to send people in. These are dangerous environments, hazmat suits, something goes wrong, people could lose lives. But this is the only option we have. So what we're trying to accomplish here is we want to have your hands anywhere. We want it to feel like your hands, be controlled like your hands, be intuitive as possible. Uh, we set up sort of guidelines around, oh, so, sorry. A uh, lot of good reasons why we'd want to do this. Uh, you could teleport skills remotely, so imagine if you're in a remote region and you need an expert, a uh, specialty piece of equipment breaks out on an oil rig, and you need the guy who designed it to take a look at a few things, but he's not there. Doctors in remote locations, excellent use for making this intuitive thing if they could just jump into some gloves and feel like their hands are remote. Outstanding application. Obviously, the dangerous and inaccessible environments like space, deep sea, and nuclear, where they want to have dexterous interaction, but we don't want to put people there for cost, expense, or safety reasons. 
Uh, as we start uh, getting semi-autonomous behaviors in the robot, you can maybe have one person controlling multiple robots and improving their efficiency. And finally, uh, all of this data going between the hands and the operator uh, is perfect for demonstration learning to automate these types of tasks. So we came up with some objectives. We wanted the highest fidelity telerobot we could get. We wanted to have full dexterity, full sensory capabilities, uh, full range of motion control. We've got about seven degrees of freedom in the arms and wrist. Uh, the hand has anywhere between 22 and 23 degrees of freedom, depending on who you ask. Uh, we want all the sensory feedback, too. We want vision, sound, force, uh, position feedback, pressure, vibration, thermal, and pain. Um, this is asking a lot, and these are really, really, really hard problems to solve. But about August last year, uh, we got together a team, and we said, you know what? We think we've got the technology to actually solve a good chunk of this right now. So I want to talk a little bit about the technology. So this is how we see most mechanical systems working. You start off, you've got some sort of intelligence. In humans, we've got our brains to make decisions for us. They control actuators, like our muscles in the human body. Those actuators either directly interact with sensors of the wor or through the world uh, to give us sensory information, some popular ones like sight, sound, uh, touch. And that information's fed back to the brain for conscious feedback, as well as some information reflexively fed back. So like when you trip, when you're walking, that sensory information helps you recover. So we'll talk about reflexes towards the end of the talk. So we look at this system right here, and we started realizing we had some of these components. Our collaborators at Shadow Robot Company make this fully dexterous hand uh, that has 20 degrees of freedom and can move just like your hands. We've got great technologies to record vision and sound. We didn't have to solve those problems. My company, Syntouch, makes a great tactile sensor that works a lot like a human fingertip. So next question is, what are we doing for the brain? Uh, we're not AI experts, so we like the human brain. How are we getting this information back to the brain? And of course, there's lots of things that could be going around. We could have neural interfaces, you know, e EKG electrodes. Uh, we decided the best thing to do is to directly capture that information and play it back in the most natural way possible. We'll catch, capture the user's actual hand motions and play back tactile information directly on their fingers the way they would feel it normally. Intuitive, less invasive, works really well. So I want to talk a little bit about the sense of touch. It's broken down into two categories. Uh, you've got cutaneous touch, which is in the skin, which was what uh, Roland Johansson and his team would block when they did that match lighting experiment. And we've got proprioceptive touch, touch, which is in the muscles and joints, the arm. So cutaneous touch is broken down into a few different categories. We're able to sense forces and deformation, uh, shear force, as well as high resolution pressure. Uh, we could detect vibrations related to slip and texture. You could also capture thermal information and how quickly the objects you're touching are heating or cooling or drawing heat in and out of your body. And there's also pain. For proprioceptive touch, uh, we've got ways to capture the force in the muscles uh, as well as the position and velocity. So in the artificial domain, proprioceptive touch is very well covered. Uh, we've got strain gauges and position encoders that in many ways are exceeding their biological counterparts. Uh, so that, that's, that's working outstandingly. But for the cutaneous touch, it's been a difficult problem that's been challenging uh, academic research for about 30 to 40 years. So my company, Syntouch, makes these tactile sensors that work like the human fingertip. It consists of a rigid core uh, that contains all the sensory electronics. These are these green fingertips at the tip of the robot. There's a green silicone skin on the end. Uh, and if you guys have a, a chance, uh, they have this squishy compliance feel because there's a fluid under that skin that gives it a compliance similar to the human fingertip. Uh, the robust and easily replaced uh, skin, we've actually done it twice this week. Uh, so I can confirm that they're easy to do with minimal tools. And it's got these three sensing modalities, force, vibration, and touch. Uh, so the way the biotech senses force is force is applied to the surface of the skin to form the skin in fluid. Uh, and we've got this array of electrodes on the surface of the core. So as that skin and fluid deform, the electrical uh, resistance between these electrodes is changing. And we could actually measure that information in terms of where it's being touched. Uh, and we could even extract shear forces, radius of curvature information from that rich electrode data. 
We also were able to sense vibrations. So when you slide your fingertip over a textured surface, it produces a unique spectrum of text, uh, vibrations, a spectral signal that represents that texture. And in my thesis was actually used on focusing on how can we use these vibrations to understand what that surface is. And we're actually able to discriminate surfaces better than humans can based on their texture. We could also use that information to detect slip. Um, if you look carefully in the picture in the center, there's a nice fingerprint surface on the surface of the skin that's actually been shown to enhance these vibrations we get about 30-fold. So that's our running theory of why people have fingerprints, not just for the FBI, but to enhance the vibrations you get when sliding over a surface. Finally, we have thermal sensing. So uh, if I were to touch a piece of metal or a piece of plastic in my environment, the metal is going to feel colder, but not because it is. It's because of the thermal conductivity. So I'm at body temperature, sorry, uh, and everything else is at room temperature. But when I touch something like metal, it's going to suck the heat out of my finger at a cold, uh, faster rate and feel cooler. Uh, we've implemented those same capabilities in the biotech. So it's a pretty high-performing sensor. Syntouch primarily uses this to characterize the way surfaces feel on 15 dimensions. Uh, we've tested more than 10,000 surfaces and have been able to fully quantify how they feel uh, differently. If you could feel the difference, we could quantify it. We've never uh, encountered a situation where that wasn't true. So it's a high-performing biomimetic sensor. It pairs very nicely with the fully anthropomorphic shadow dexterous hand that Mike's demonstrating right here. So uh, one of the amazing feats of this hand is they managed to get all 20 degrees of freedom, just like the human hand, plus the additional four underactuated degrees on the distal joint integrated in this small hand that's actually the size of a human hand. Truly amazing. All the motors are down in the base here. Uh, Tendon-driven hand. So we've got this human-sized hand with human kinematics. Uh, complex device, and, and some people might think, well, why wouldn't we just use something simple? Uh, Shunk makes these great two degree of freedom grippers in every shape and size. They're cheap, they're fast, they're reliable, they're effective. Um, and really what it comes down to is if you have a lot of parts, you would need a lot of grippers. Uh, we wanted something fully anthropomorphic, be able to grab anything. Uh, we could debate whether our hands are optimized to grab everything in the world, or if we've just designed the world around us to be optimized to our hands. But it's undeniable that these are great tools for picking up just about anything. So that's what we wanted to copy. So if you get into this scenario, we have lots of parts and need lots of things to pick up. There's some people, sponsors of this event, that may need to pick up lots of different things and ship them away. This is a great tool for that. Uh, they're using people to actually pack boxes right now. They know this. So Shadow Hand also has great sensory integration. Uh, we've got position sensing at every single joint, all 24. Uh, the 20 active joints have motor current temperature sensing at each actuator. Uh, the opposing tendons for each actuator each have a strain gauge. So we've got position, torque, uh, great, great sensory feedback. Obviously, we've been able to integrate the tactile sensors into it accurately. Uh, we've got tons of microcontrollers, CAN bus, EtherCAT, great interfaces to stream all the sensory data back at a one kilohertz bandwidth. So that's the shadow dexterous hand, amazing piece of hardware. To complete this, uh, Mike, who's actually from Haptics, uh, Haptics has these haptic gloves. Uh, these are a great tool. Uh, they provide two different types of tactile feedback and precision motion tracking. So the first tactile feedback, you see the video on the top right, we've got these pneumatic bladders uh, that replay these taxile uh, information. They can, each bladder can deform to, a, to about two millimeter, and there's 130 different ones spread across the fingertips of, and palm. Uh, no perceivable latency and great frequency response, and they actually pair very nicely with the electrodes in the biotech. So when you squish it in the top right corner, Mike can feel that in the top right corner. Uh, really cool stuff. They can make these panels in any shape and size and cover any surface, and they're uh, well integrated into the gloves. Uh, another great piece of feedback for those higher forces, uh, we've got uh, force feedback, uh, which is a tendon braking system. So essentially what this is, it's like admittance braking. We're not actively controlling the force. We're just stopping the finger from advancing. And that can go up to about 18 newtons of resistive force. Uh, you could either vary that so it could slip a little with the clutch or lock into place. And that's what allows Mike to be able to feel the shape of an object, a rigid object that he's squeezing. 
Finally, what's outstanding since we're using pneumatics uh, and tendons, there's no metal in the fingertips. And that gives them outstanding magnetic motion uh, tracking. So they've got a magnetic source in the uh, knuckle area and sensors in each fingertip. And since there's no magnetic interference, they've got outstanding motion tracking with submillimeter precision on all six degrees of freedom. Uh, Occlusion-free works outstandingly well. Uh, and we'll demo that in a little bit too. So those are the haptic gloves. So we've got this great hardware going together to fill this hard, uh, the model that we have. So our development strategy was pretty straightforward. We wanted to take the motion capture and control from the gloves to directly control the hands. There was some mapping involved with that. Uh, the sensors, we mapped that tactile data directly back to the hand. Uh, and we mechanically and electrically integrated the sensors into the hand so that everything tied together quite nicely. What made this uh, project really exciting and challenging is this was done across the globe. So Syntouch and Haptex, Mike and I's company, are in California. The robot hand and the arms were in London. So we did a lot of development with the gloves in California over the Atlantic controlling the hands in London. Uh, we were sponsored by ANA who's in Tokyo, which made conference calling absolutely horrible. Uh, we always had the worst time slot. Mike and I would be up at midnight for that one because it's eight hours each way. Um, so why have an airline involved in any of this, right? It seems like a suspicious partner for three small robotics companies. Um, it's really interesting. So the airline's business model is to transport people from A to B. And only 6% of the world travel. That's a really interesting statistic we learned from that. Uh, only 6% of the world travel. And this is 94% of the market that's ripe to be opened up to transporting people to remote locations. So they're really interested in this. Uh, it fits their business model well. So we built this outstanding proof of concept. Uh, one of the first things we had to do, of course, working across the globe is type out hello world, right, on a keyboard. Um, we're going to invite Penny up on stage and, and Jeff Nunn to kind of demo the capabilities of the sensor. Uh, why don't you guys walk through a few things? Cool. Cool. Great. So, Jeff, I'm going to want you to. Please meet you. Shake his hand first. How's it feel? Awesome. I love that. <laughs> natural. Natural. <laughs> Weirdly natural. Weirdly natural. So, <laughs> we want to demonstrate to you that he is feeling in his fingertips. So I'm going to get him to blindfold himself, and I'm going to get you to touch any finger, and he's going to wiggle it. Ring finger, middle finger, index. Nice. Cool. If you push back on the finger, so go ahead and push up on the index finger, or ring finger, yeah, or any finger. So just push on his finger. My fingers, yeah, good, just push. There you go. Just keep oh, pushing. Yes. Yeah. So my fingers will lock in place to wherever you place it. So he's yeah. placing force back on you. Just like that, yeah. yeah. Releases. Um, um, what would you like to do? Oh, fist bump, totally. <laughs> do you want to do? You can have a head massage if you want. Oh, like a back massage, actually. Back massage? Yeah. <laughs> 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 you tussle your hair a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get the backpack? Yeah. So what's really key here, since we've got touch, we could do things that were really difficult to do without vision. Or sorry, without touch. With the, very difficult to do with vision alone. Put your hands back. This is Penny's bag. She's leaving today, so might be some personal items in there. Do the TSA job. <laughs> which, which pocket am I opening? Which pocket? Which pocket? The big one. Yeah. Is this my first airport security test? That's right. <laughs> We're going to have to check everyone's bags before you leave, too. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
You packed this really well. Hmm? You packed it really well. Oh, sorry. The idea was to make it robot proof. Robot proof? Mm hmm. Or mic proof. Clearly. It's a little bit of performance anxiety. I'm paused. Technical difficulties, don't worry. Fingers still work. So the system does have protective stop, prevents me from slamming through the table. We got it on the right hand for a second there. Touch and arms are important. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right. Can we reset Right hand? Left hand? Um, pause. Okay. Let's get this bag open, huh? Yeah, there's fragile stuff in there. Don't throw it off the table. Wow. There you go. Yeah. There we go. Too far over to the left. Yeah. All right. Just gonna reach in here. Do you want a hand? <laughs> I feel like this bag is empty and you're just pulling a prank on me. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hold the bag in place? Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, both. Give them another minute or two here. Sorry for the difficulties, <laughs> guys. Yeah, What's yeah. that? Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's the safety plane. So we moved and had an hour to set up up here. So. <laughs> Show off some shear force while you're ready to reset the arms. <laughs> so another thing that he could feel too is uh, when you apply shear force to the fingertips, he could tell which direction we're sliding. Uh, yeah, if you want to push on one of the fingers one way, and Michael tell you which way it's sliding. Just slide it. Yeah. You're sliding that way. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um. So okay. since we've got this high fidelity tactile feedback, not only can you tell where you're touching, uh, but we could also tell which direction you're sliding, which is actually useful for a lot of Just these dexterous tasks yeah. in a very subconscious way. Do we want to? You're sliding that way. Mm -hmm. Let's keep going, and you guys can reset that while I keep talking about slides. So we'll get back to that demo at the end while they reset the arms. So uh, one of the questions, why, why do any of this? Why build this high fidelity tactile telerobot? So um, what, are, what are the next steps for us to, or essentially where we're at? So we've got this full system. This is what it looks like today. Uh, we're able to directly control the hands, feel what the hands are feeling, and play that information back to the operator. Uh, some of the next steps we'd like to add is uh, reflexes. 
can we have these autonomous behaviors locally in the hand so they can enact, uh, react intelligently? Uh, and we've already done a good amount of research in understanding the way tactile reflexes directly benefit prosthetic hands. So this is uh, some work we've done incorporating fragile grasping reflexes into prosthetic hands. We've got these uh, compliant tactile sensors in the fingertip that are able to detect when they collide with an object and have an inhibitory reflex that prevents the operator from crushing the object unless they don't want to. Uh, so what you see over there on the right, uh, we compared the performance of the subject's sound side unamputated limb to move 10 crackers, uh, quick and fluid. Uh, over on the left, we've got the prosthetic hand with the reflex. You can see it's also fluid. Uh, and in the middle is a normal prosthetic hand uh, with no tactile reflexes at all. And you see there's intense visual concentration required to complete the task. So uh, what we generally find is for the sound side hand, 10 objects take about 10 seconds to move, regardless of if they're fragile or rigid or what they are. Uh, it mostly depends on how far you have to move them. Uh, with this prosthetic hand, when we introduce these reflexes, it's about 16 seconds compared to 28 seconds with their prosthetic hand without reflexes. So like we've recovered about two thirds of the disability of losing their hand by adding these reflexes in towards the natural human performance. Um, like I was saying, again, touch doesn't make things pos uh, Things are possible without touch. They just make them intuitive and fluid. Uh, this is sort of a summary slide of the research we did with the prosthetic grasping. Uh, from the left to right, you see fragile to rigid objects. Uh, and we count how long it takes subjects to move these objects. So for their sound side hand, this is their unamputated hand, like I said, it's about 10 seconds to move 10 objects. You get fast performance, low variability between trials. Doesn't matter if the object's rigid or fragile at all. Uh, with the normal prosthetic hand, as that object becomes more fragile, the performance and variability suffer greatly. And, and, and as we've done these studies, one of the things we've learned is not necessarily that it takes longer to do the task that's bad, it's that variability that's bad. They, they don't know if they're going to crush or drop a cracker when they break it, so they don't grab it. They'll use their other hand always. Uh, but when we introduce these smart reflexes, we start getting characteristics that are just like a sound side hand because we've put in touch and reflexes that are in your sound side hand directly into the prosthetic. It's not quite as fast as the human hand, but every object takes about 16 to 17 seconds regardless of how fragile it is, and the variability is reduced and consistent across objects, which is tremendously important. Uh, if you recall this slide earlier, we compared touch alone versus vision alone and found that touch is better. Well, now we had a tool to actually evaluate that. So here's a video. On the left side, uh, we've got this tactile reflex without uh, the subject's blindfolded. And on the right side, there's a prosthetic hand that can't feel, but the subject can see just fine. So let's compare performance. Uh, initially, with the prosthetic hand that can feel, there's a little bit of lag trying to figure out where things are. But once he's got himself calibrated on how to make his two hands meet, it's quite fluid. Uh, on the right side, you see there's a lot of visual concentration. He's got to slow down the fingertips and decide exactly when to stop uh, without crushing the object. He could do the task. It just takes a little longer. So again, this touch is really what makes these things fluid. Um, it takes about 22 seconds to do the blindfolded task with the reflexes, which is a little slower than the 16 seconds when he had vision as well, but still better than having vision alone. So these reflexes are tremendously important. Another great reason to do this as biomimetically and anthropomorphically as we did uh, is we could leverage all of the training and experience we've had over our lives, decades and decades of interacting with objects intuitively and naturally are accessible to us. We don't have to learn how to control a weird robot with weird fingers and weird feedback. It's natural, it's fluid. Uh, we had Jeff Bezos in the system uh, Wednesday night. He said, Weird, weirdly natural was his quote. So it's, it really is, it's natural and fluid uh, and intuitive. So we wanna get these inputs and outputs as native as possible so anyone could hop in uh, and start using the system well. Mike's got, uh, I'm gonna say, 10 to 12 hours of experience with this robot to date. Uh, Leif, who's up front, just tried it this time. He was stacking cups in about 20 minutes. Uh, some people get it right away, uh, it's, and it's truly amazing. But what I really wanna point out here is, again, touch isn't 
essential to do tests. They do surgery without touch. I can't even do surgery right now. Trained surgeons can do surgical, surgical procedures without touch. It just requires a lot of training uh, and this mind's eye experience. In fact, uh, there's some case studies going on right now that they're, they're finding out that surgeons who initially did the laparoscopic surgery, which is operating these tools with their hands, they could feel what they're doing. When they translate to robotic surgery where, without that sense of touch, they've got this mind's eye of what things feel like, and they're more delicate with the tissues than newer surgeons that are jumping straight into the, the teleoperated surgery without laparoscopic experience. So uh, touch definitely benefits the training uh, that goes into these systems, so you could create this mind's eye of what things feel like based on what they're looking at. But again, you have to move very slowly, uh, and that visual feedback's used to not dexterously interact with things, but replan. Something goes wrong, you look at the situation, you create a new plan, and you execute. We see it in the crackers. If he goes too far, or if he goes, doesn't go far enough, he stops and makes another small movement. And rather than this fluid, Grasping, it's plan, 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 execute, plan, execute, plan, execute, it takes a lot more time. But it is possible, you can do surgery. So telerobots without touch, you need a lot of training, surgical training to do these things well. There's a tremendous amount of preparation time before perform, uh, performing an operation, more than just a typical surgical operation that you do with your bare hands. Uh, and you have to be careful and slow tremendously expensive, and it only makes sense for the most inaccessible and dangerous task out there. Um, we're hoping that by introducing telerobots with touch, we can make this intuitive and natural. Uh, anyone jumps in, they've got their intelligence and dexterity at their fingertips, uh, match, matched with this robotic uh, ability to be in dangerous and inaccessible environments. So tremendous power here. Finally. Uh, as you can see, Mike's performing these outstandingly dexterous tasks. He can feel the hands, he can control them with precision. Uh, we've done this with a headset, so he could do it all through a camera. We could have him off-site. We've done it with a robot in London, and he's in San Luis Obispo. All of that sensory and control data is digitized, which makes it outstanding training data to learn how to automate a task. Just an existence proof. If he could do this task with that data stream, we should be able to learn it. Uh, that's not our expertise. If any of you guys are strong in that area, we'd love to talk to you and see where this could go in the long term. Uh, but that's generally where we're at, and I think this has a lot of power. So just as a concluding slide, uh, touch, I hopefully have convinced you that touch is very critical for manipulation and perception. Uh, just about everything is still possible without touch, but touch is what makes these difficult and intuitive, uh, difficult tasks easy and intuitive. Uh, and we've got this high fidelity teleoperation, which is going to be great training data for future AI and machine learning. Um, this wouldn't have been possible without an amazing team. Uh, there's about nine of us here right now sitting up the front row. I'd like to thank them. This has been one of the funnest projects we've worked on. I've worked on in many years. Uh, it's really hard to get one company to work together. I'm amazed that we've got three companies to work together as well as we have. Uh, it's been an amazing experience. Uh, and I'd like to end before a final demo on a note. So as we're controlling this robot in San Luis Obispo, uh, the robot's in London. We're in San Luis Obispo controlling it. Obviously, the very first thing we've got to type across the world is hello world on a keyboard that's in London. Of course, very, very first time, uh, Oops, we we're running yeah, into some that's, problems. That's something strange, Nate. Get some latency issues, control. We yeah, haven't quite worked yeah. out those bugs. Yeah. But we pause, wait for things oh. to reset. Mike gives yeah, it's it another not go. At all right now. So this is the very first transatlantic message typed uh, via telerobot. For those of you who know the layout of a US keyboard, okay. maybe you'll get the punchline. <laughs> very first message. Kind of over pushes here in a second. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first message uh, transmitted across the Atlantic. Um, do we have things working? Did you want to finish up that demo? We've got maybe another five minutes before we can open up for questions. Uh, I'd be happy to take a few questions right now uh, while he performs that task.
Ratchet one more time. Good. Oh, he cheated. <laughs> yes. So the question was, do we have any plans to have, uh, did you say muscular feedback or tactile feedback? Like grounded force feedback? Um, that's something that was on the longer term timeline. Uh, this demo was mostly comprised of stuff we have today. So this is all equipment that existed prior to that. Uh, grounded force feedback would add a lot of value, especially when interacting with planes and, and more immovable objects. Uh, we do have the resistive feedback in each fingertip, so as Mike grabs an object, he could feel when he's collided with it uh, and squeeze it and determine if it's rigid and squishy, but it's not grounded, fully grounded. Um, that's on a longer timeline, but it, I think outstanding information to add that's really useful, especially for operating with bigger objects. Yes? It, it seems like there would be some at least physical uh, limitations that you would arrive at in, in terms of returning feedback to the user um, with those inflatable pads, yeah. um, whereas the, the synthetic fingertips on the robot arm, I imagine, can capture a lot more data. Um, do you find that the users um, ever feel like they're sort of not getting all the information they could from the fingertips, or the present pads kind of giving them everything they need? And if perhaps not, how, how yeah. small do you think those can go? Uh, so generally speaking, I, I think we've been just impressed with having it. So we haven't started getting picky uh, yet. We just built the bimanual system on Tuesday. It was everything was unimanual. So um, I don't know if you guys are seeing this, but he's been doing like in-hand manipulation. That just happened last week. So we've been kind of just blown away right now. I give us six months to answer that question and we'll start getting like, oh yeah, it needs to be better. Um, I feel like uh, sometimes one of the things we'd like to do is maybe have some sort of adjustable amplifier for the tactile feedback. Because sometimes when we're doing something delicate, we feel like it's not strong enough or we're doing something rigid, it feels like it's triggering too early. Uh, so the, the, the range of tactile feedback that is. So it'd be really cool to be able to adjust like, like, a, like a volume knob that you could turn up and down. Like I wanna turn up the touch volume and feedback. Um, that would be the first thing I'd fix. I'm pretty happy with the resolution in terms of how it's distributing. You could feel it rolling around your finger quite well. Uh, I think it's overkill for what we need. Um, if I were to make improvements, I think the thing we need to do is to get more tactile coverage on the hand. These gloves are equipped to display uh, on the palm too, and we don't have sensors on the palm. So that would be the next thing. Um, Mike can do this great in-hand manipulation. Um, he's gotten pretty darn good at this, but the rest of us, when it drops down to the palm, it gets tricky because you can't feel. It's easier for us to do it upside down so it doesn't drop into the palm. Mike's just amazing at this though. So. Uh, but that's what I'd say next. I'd get, the, I'd get more coverage before I start adding resolution. Yeah. Yes? Uh, communication latencies, uh, have you been able to withstand? Yeah. So, Tony, correct me if I'm wrong, but around here, uh, we're about 120 uh, milliseconds latency, is that right? Just, and we're tethered, right? Uh, Transatlantic, can you tell me what we did on that? 400 to 500 milliseconds when we were going from California to London. Um, we were using Zoom, it's a video conferencing software for the video, uh, and Tony's magic to transmit the data, he's the expert on that stuff. Uh, but what was really interesting is you could feel before you can see, and that, um, that was actually really useful. And um, I think ideally you'd feel and see naturally. If the touch comes later, it feels wrong. But if the touch comes earlier, it's okay. So I think uh, where this needs to go for lower latency stuff is maybe prioritizing some of the tactile information so they got, that gets through quickly. Um, that's not my area of expertise, but I know we do have some partners that are working on like very low latency transmission across the globe. That said, um, 
as we, as we add reflexes on the robot side, it sort of mitigates the need for high fidelity, high speed feedback. You know, your conscious feedback loop is about 200, 200 uh, milliseconds. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, do you envision that people will uh, specially train to use this equipment? It seems like there's a certain amount of investment that you need to use before it becomes relevant, but thereafter you expect it to kind of pay off. Yeah. Um, what I've seen in the maybe 100 people who have tried this, a good amount of them just straight up get it. And, and um, it's expensive equipment. Uh, so those who know the value of the equipment tend to get really delicate with it. Um, those who don't have been making us all go like, ugh. <laughs> um, I think there's a comfort threshold that different people get over at different rates before they start treating it you know, more, more fluidly. Uh, it's not necessarily a skill threshold, it's just a comfort threshold. Because it's different, it's weird. You're not expecting this high fidelity tactile feedback. Uh, and then you subconsciously start using it. And then you become Mike and you just do crazy stuff every day. <laughs> yeah. Do you, have plans to, uh, do you have plans to incorporate the temperature and texture feedback in some way? Yeah, that's uh, next on the line. Um, the current uh, haptic taxels inside the haptics gloves can actually replay high frequency data up to about 200 hertz, right, Mike? 200 hertz, which is good for this vibration-related texture. <laughs> Sorry, I distracted him, see? Um, so we're gonna try that out next and come up with ways to feed that back and see how it feels for different textures. Um, Haptics has an outstanding solution for thermal feedback that just isn't integrated into these gloves. I'm assuming I can't say what that is. I could say that it is. Okay, so they, uh, instead of pumping in uh, room temperature fluid, they could pump in hot and cool fluid to have this outstanding thermal feedback. It's amazing. Um, they've got this refrigerator sized demo where you stick your hand into it and it like dragons come and breathe fire on you. It's like really cool. Um, and I think that, but, but speaking more to that, like I think the thermal and vibration data is more for material characterization. Like what is this material that I'm touching? The timing and contact data and the distribution and which fingers, that's what's important for manipulation. So. I think this represents like a great minimum viable product for that. Yeah. Yes, we got one over there. Pardon? Oh, no, no, I was sending the mic over to you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, if I recall correctly, part of your perception is that you get a sense of where your body is in relation to other objects in space, like integration with vision. I got uh, the impression that y'all consider prior perception to be kind of a solved problem. Um, are you able to sense where the hands are in space? And if so, does that cause, does your natural prior perception like cause any interference? Yeah. So, good question, and, and just to reiterate, the question was on proprioception and how, how the operator can sense that? Okay, so um, if you noticed in the beginning, uh, the way we did that is we tried to align the robot and the operator naturally. So uh, when we had that problem earlier with the arms, what he did, he would bring one hand up here, he'd move the other hand up here, and then he would match the pose, uh, and that keeps the calibration. So there's also that visual feedback to make sure that Visual is pretty key in sort of uh, 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 fixing for any drift in your proprioceptive feedback. Uh, and then also, you know, when you move the hand forward, when you move your hand forward and that hand moves forward, it's pretty intuitive. Um, that was solved with some pretty clever mapping, and I think it was a bigger problem in the exact fingertips. You want the fingers to match the pose. Uh, Tony, our rock star at the end, solved that uh, with some really good mapping of the hand. Prior to just a week ago, you kind of had to do weird things like, okay, my thumb needs to move forward, and your hand would get into a, a, an awkward pose to match a grasp that you wanted, but now it's really good. So you just, it, it matches your hand pretty fluidly, uh, and rather than thinking about how to move each finger, you're thinking about your hand as one thing. You know, I want this kind of grasp, I want that kind of grasp. Um, that's sort of been the evolution of it. We, we started with, let's control each finger visually, calibrating, 
to now it just matches our natural proprioception and becomes incredibly intuitive. And that was a big stepping stone to making this easy to use. Yeah. How are we doing on the, I haven't been watching you. Are you getting anything out yet? Well, the bag was empty. The bag was empty. <laughs> it was empty on one side. Okay. Penny, I thought you were going home today. <laughs> <laughs> you got some items. Yeah. We, we, got, we got a biotag. <laughs> yes. Well. Some, some nifty glasses. So we've got some great videos of this. Uh, yesterday, Mike successfully took my wallet out of my pocket and took out all my money. Um, I didn't even notice. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Putting glasses on people's faces. Uh, what would have been your guys' favorites? Uh, he takes the Rubik's Cube out of the box and solves it. It was kind of set up to be easy because none of us know how to actually do that. Uh, and then put it back in the box and close it. Um, we've got this great video of him like flipping around a floss container and spinning it. Um, we haven't quite got throwing right because the arms are slowly, we, we've restricted their speed so no one gets hurt. Um, so we could throw it like two feet. <laughs> it's not, not that impressive. Yes? Two questions. How yes. much is the whole system now? Yeah. And then another question is, um, if you are, you know, if he's right now seeing with a bare eyes, but yeah. if you're to put any uh, camera in remote uh, place on, on the uh, robot, where is the ideal place? Yeah. We had this uh, running yesterday, and we kind of put the camera uh, kind of close to where his actual eyes are right now, and that worked pretty well. I think it was a little bit closer, maybe more halfway between his eyes and the backpack was a good place to put the camera. Um, I don't know the complexity or cost of the additional camera system. Uh, Rich Walker, who's in the back, uh, again, these are all hardware that each of our companies make and the systems available today. Uh, he could answer any pricing questions depending on needs and how many arms related to that. Uh, that said, this is research hardware. Uh, so it is expensive. Uh, ideally, we'd like to get this technology cheaper in scale. Um, I think for this to be commercially successful on a broad scale, we need to get it closer to the cost of a car, uh, which it is much more than today. I guess it depends on the car. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> it's a very nice car right now. <laughs> nice work, my. <laughs> he could throw and make a mess, too. We make him clean up too. I've got two kids. We make them clean up after they make a mess. So, Mike. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, really quick, I'd recommend that we dismantle the left arm. Yeah, I'm uh, very impressive uh, teleoperated manipulation. So, I, I'm thinking about autonomous. Uh, Dexter's manipulation as the, yesterday Professor Goldberg, yeah. Ken Goldberg uh, presented. Yep. So uh, I think uh, it is more possible that because you have a very wonderful sensors and uh, feedback at, uh, at the mask club, but uh, what do you think about the, uh, and what is your plan to make, autonom make it autonomous manipulation yeah. based on the machine learning and reinforcement? Yeah. So uh, Ken Goldberg was on the bus to the party with us, and we talked about it, and that's my plan. <laughs> um, that's not my area of expertise. I find it very interesting. Um, we'd love to partner with people that know this. I, I, I'm up to date with this sim to real stuff. Um, so just to clarify that to the room, these are people that are creating models of robot environments, simulating multiple interactions, and trying to figure out best solutions for that, and then applying it to real robotics. I kind of think it'd be cool to use a system like this to go real to sim to real, where you're kind of gathering information about what that real environment is, simulating a lot of iterations, and then applying it back. Again, I'm not qualified to say if that's a good idea or not. Uh, you're shaking your head, so maybe it isn't. <laughs> but demonstration learning uh, are the buzzwords I've heard, and uh, our plan is to email Ken on Monday. <laughs> Uh, any further questions? Cool. So we got about five minutes left. We'll let them do some interesting stuff with the right hand. And then what I'd like to request uh, so that we could get this stuff successfully off the stage uh, before the next talk starts is Rich Walker is in the back corner over there. He's the unmistakable guy in these suits and dreadlocks. Uh, I'll be joining him over there. If anyone would like to talk to us after the talk, uh, please meet us in that corner so we could keep this stage clear. 
Uh, we have five minutes. Did we want to let um, anyone shake hands or? Oh, Mike wants to put the sunglasses on himself. Single hand manipulation, guys. <laughs> it counts. They feel the same. That's what's amazing. You can't even tell the difference anymore. <laughs> uh, if anyone would like to shake hands with the or is that a bad idea, Rich? That's a bad idea. Never mind. If anyone would like to see Penny shake hands with the robot, <laughs> stay in your seats. Yeah. All right, so uh, we're going to start dismantling. I'll be in that back corner uh, with Rich for any questions. And I'd like to thank you all for coming at 9 a.m. Uh, thank this team that made this incredible robot happen. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a blast. So thank you, guys.